team of the Town and Pittsburgh Board of Commissioners and um, call ourselves to order. And at this point, we usually open with a moment of silence. Today, I would like to do so remembering John Clifford, who served on the planning board um, as well as other capacities in the Town of Pittsburgh, and Ileana Platon's mother also had passed away. So if we could uh, keep those two in our thoughts as we take a moment so
there was a uh, uh, initial presentations and then time for questions and they were excellent questions and I think it helped us all to be there at the same time, same place, and hear the same things even though we may interpret them differently. So um, I think that's going to continue. I hope it's going to continue on a quarterly basis. I said to Jim Crawford that I thought that, that all of us would love to continue that. So, so any other thoughts from that, um, from that joint meeting? No, I, just, I think it was it was great to have the dialogue with all three boards um, because um, I'd say like never before. I think um, going forward, they're they're all interchanged. It's important to have that conversation. I think we'll do that again. I, I did also attend a uh, ADC meeting. It was Kyle Touchstone's first meeting in which he acted as president of the. Economic Development Corporation, and we had a presentation uh, by the Newland communities about Briar Chapel. Uh, that was very interesting uh, to hear the discussions of the proposal for the commercial districts there in the front, and um, uh, and so that was just excellent. Any other reports from me? I just thought I'd mention um, I attended an. Uh, that was someone from the Chatham, North Carolina Arts Council today. I'm vice president of the Chatham County Arts Council. And uh, it was great. He had some suggestions on um, if we want to pursue having a public art um, ordinance. He had some very good suggestions about um, some good examples in the state, as well as who to talk to at the North Carolina Arts Council. So I thought that was very worthwhile. into old business. The oh, oh, okay. actually, I had a good report. Oh, excellent. Sorry, I didn't uh, jump, jump forward on that. Um, yes, last Wednesday, the Chatham County Climate Change Advisory Committee did meet, and previously, uh, one other member and myself had met uh, in an informal capacity to review something called a baseline report. Um, and for the public, for the benefit of the board, uh, as the county tries to figure out what it's to do about climate change, if anything, either mitigating climate change, doing our part to heal climate, and or uh, doing what we can to protect our citizens and investments here in the county uh, and resources from the changes that will be happening. That would be adaptation. Um, it's important to understand where we are and where we've come from with regard to our emissions, on the positive side, the fact that 59% of the county is a sink for greenhouse gas in the form of carbon dioxide. All of our forests and our farms are an attribute. Um, they're a real asset um, in that. And so we had broken off, just the two of us, and uh, studied a report that was made in 2010 um, on that subject and um, by a student at Duke University. Uh, it's an adequate report. We think it needs to be updated. We think that uh, we can update ourselves without county expenditures. But um, some things have changed significantly. Our industry has declined since then. Um, confined animal feeding operations have declined since then. So agriculture has, has probably declined. Um, some other things. But I agree to uh, that being formed as a subcommittee. I agree to join that subcommittee on baselines. Um, establishing that data and I also agreed to serve on a subcommittee on agriculture and forestry and the role it might play in a positive sense <coughs> in helping Chatham County both protect ourselves against and prepare for climate change. Um, so that's mine. Great, thank you. I know you've been anxious for that committee to get going and um, that's wonderful to yes. have that. There was one other meeting I attended on an informal basis. The school board had asked that people come and join their group last week um, uh, to talk about how to be a better ambassador for the school system. They didn't have um, any immediate positive projects, but just were trying to garner folks together so that when the, when the time came that it would be a smoother process to communicate what it is that is happening in our schools. So, um, so our old business, uh, Jeff Jones, we would love to hear from you about the planning board appointment. Thank you, 
Mr. Mayor, members of the board. At our last meeting, um, you all, the Fulton Town Board, voted to reconfigure the planning board from a 3-3 split of in town to ETJ membership uh, to a 4-2 split, um, four being in town and two being ETJ members. So tonight uh, on your agenda is to select four in-town members um, with, well, three regular members and then one alternate member to the board. Um, and you've had uh, the applications for about a month now to be able to review those. And um, again, entertain any questions that you may have. It's really um, up to you all to, to make that those decisions. What we'll have is um, we'll get to the next slide and there'll be um, three m votes that you'll that you'll do. You'll do um, the first one twice. Brian can we advance the slide. So you'll move uh, twice to appoint to the plan board for a three year term retroactive to the January 15th um, meeting time of the term ending in December of 17. That is to keep our balance of when people will rotate on and when, when seats rotate off of the board. Um, then you're going to make a, an appointment to the planning board as an alternate in town membership, um, with, with that term also ending in 2017. And then you're going to move to appoint uh, a member to the to a regular board member to the planning board for a three year term that started in January of 2016. And I don't know if the entire board received it, but I received an email from Casey Mann requesting that her application be withdrawn. She's taken some other board positions and feels that those are going to, uh, and she's also gotten a uh, job with John Record and feels that it would be best for her not to serve at this time. Yeah, or are we making three appointments to the planning board and one as an alternate? Or two yeah. yeah, you're making three regular regular seat appointments mm -hmm. and one alternate seat appointment. Well, yeah. one of the regulars is ETJ. Mm -hmm. One of the regulars is an ETJ. Two in town. No. Um, the, the regular ETJ membership, that seat, was converted to an in town membership okay. at the last meeting. We have currently have two ETJ members that are on the board, okay. uh, Brian Taylor and Rayford Bland, the chair. Those those two will remain. We're really just adding um, three new members, in town members, to the board. So, uh, is there? A, I only see three. The first one you'll you'll do twice. Okay, so, so those we'll appoint two members. You you can appoint. You can use the first motion to twice. Got it. With whomever you choose to appoint to that two, it's effectively a two-year seat uh, for the first motion. There, you will be appointing two two folks to, to a two essentially a two-year term. I understand the sequencing here because of the the logic uh, the chronology, but do you have any qualms with us leaving the alternate for last? You can do it just. Yes, whatever you choose to do. Yeah, I agree with that. And I suggest just to keep things clear in my head, uh, it might be easier to decide on the full board members and then leave the alternate till last. Mm -hmm. We have consensus on that. It's good. Would you like to begin by the motion? Yes, I would. I'd like to make a motion to uh, appoint Alfreda Al Austin the planning board for a three year term retroactive to January 2015 with the term ending in December of 2017. Okay. You've heard the motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion made by Pamela Baldwin, seconded by Michael Fiocco. Those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Thank you. For the motion. I'd like to make a motion that we appoint uh, Beth Turner to the planning board for a three year term retroactive to 2016 to the term ending in December of 2018. 
You've heard the motion by Michael Fiocco. Is there a second? May, may we discuss? Sir. Um, I have served with Beth Turner, and um, she's, I consider her a friend. And um, I was pleased to see that she has an interest in continuing public service. Um, I do feel that we have some candidates for this position that are significantly more experienced and um, bring some real, uh, real interesting background and uh, expertise uh, to planning and to the challenges that the planning board will be facing. So, um, I might also add that um, Beth Turner and I served together. Uh, I very much enjoyed our service together on the board of Child Marketplace. I, I, I won't be supporting her for this role. I, I feel the same way. I, I think the role of, of Ms. Turner and to her friend, and she's a very honorable commissioner. But I feel like um, the planning board really needs some expertise. I feel like we have some candidates that um, have experience with um, you know, soil and water and ecosystems and things that I feel would be very useful going forward. And I, I feel the same way. I feel really anxious about this, but I. Um, well, having served with um, <coughs> Beth on this board for four years, and I think she's eminently qualified. I think she's done a great job for the town. So that's the reason for my recommendation. And I concur with that. I think Beth is an excellent job. And I think that she could add something to the planning board. The expertise that she has acquired through her knowledge here as commissioner will be certainly helpful in the planning board. Is there further discussion? The motion was made by Michael Fiecko and seconded by Pamela Baldwin to appoint Beth Turner to the planning board term for three years retroactive to January 2016, with the term ending in December of 2018. Is the board ready to vote? Those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Opposed. Yeah. The uh, ayes have it, and Beth Turner is appointed to the board for the term ending in December of 2018. We have one more appointment then for the term ending in December of 2017 and the alternate. Is there a motion for either of those? I'd like to make a motion for Carl Schaefer. I know he was on the planning board at one time. He left uh, for some personal reasons, um, but uh, I think he's back in, maybe back in the saddle now. Motion made by Jay Farrell, second. seconded by, by Beth Bowley. So, um, is we'd, there we'd see the motion for 17. 17. 17. Is there discussion on the motion to have Carl Schaefer serve in that capacity? I was deeply impressed with his um, uh, qualifications and his background and expertise and uh, very strongly support that motion. Further discussion? Uh, Carl served on the planning board for several years, and I uh, really thought highly of his work on the board. Um, I think he's a very capable, objective person. So um, I've always uh, thought highly of him. The board ready to vote. Those in favor of Carl Schaefer to be appointed to the planning board for a three year term for retroactive to January 2015 with the term ending December of 2017. Those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed. I'd like to move that uh, Bob McConaughey uh, be appointed to the alternate position. 
there a second to John's motion? John Bonner's motion? Second. Seconded by Beth Foley. Beth, Beth Turner and Beth Foley are getting confused with dates. Um, and um, is there discussion on that appointment to serve as the alternate? Yeah, I, uh, I cannot support Bob. Um, I, I was witness to Bob's uh, participation in a matter that involved his property, where he stayed seated at this table, participated in the uh, discussion, recused himself from voting, but participated in the discussion. And for that reason, I, I cannot support Bob. That's interesting. Well, I think that his qualifications are really tremendous. Um, PhD in geography. Um, uh, he, he has been deeply involved in these matters. Um, I understood that uh, he was part of a group that uh, helped develop our land use plan and uh, that he also helped to develop our conservation ordinance. Um, I think he has a strong grasp of data and planning and uh, I think he can bring, bring a tremendous amount to this board. I've also gotten the distinct impression that he really takes these matters very seriously and I am just daunted by all that we have in front of us in terms of planning and um, all that the planning board will be seeing with the UDO and the small area plans and the additional elements and really think we need his expertise. Is there further board discussion? Those in favor of the motion on the floor for Bob McConaughey to be the alternate for the term expiring in December of 2017, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? No. The I have it, and uh, Bob McConaughey is selected as the alternate. Thank you, board. I'll get letters out to these uh, folks you've appointed, and letters to the ones that you did not appoint as well. The next, uh, the next agenda item for under old business is the special assessment district overview. Ryan Bruce, and Tom Messick. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. And what, what we'll do here tonight, I think, is I'll, I'll start it off, and then, as uh, as necessary, if anybody wants to interject, or uh, very very likely, Mr. Messick may want to uh, interject on something or provide more detail. And uh, he certainly uh, certainly very well could, could do that as we go on. Purpose tonight uh, is to have just a, a check-in about the special assessment district process that we've had to date, uh, and then uh, kind, of, kind of set the table for where we've been, um, what's happened recently, and then at the end, just kind of introduce a couple of considerations from the town's perspective, which we really haven't done too much of uh, up till this point in time. Um, as a as a preamble, as a very short preamble, I'd say that. But I think as we go along, we're going to see that um, there's been a lot of conceptual discussion at this point, and what's being what's being proposed uh, by the developer uh, to Chatham County, but yet having a very real effect on the town, uh, is preliminary, and it's going to take some uh, it's going to take some doing both at the local and at the legislative level. Uh, but I think it behooves us to make sure that we know exactly what's happening um, at the present. Uh, and then begin to shape some questions as we move forward so when the time comes and the county has completed their due diligence and the legislature begins their discussion. Excuse me? I, I was just hearing the storm. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Shocked. I wasn't expecting it. <laughs> Perfect. That should have looked at the words. It's only a severe thunderstorm alert. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Good. Well, you have command of the bridge now. So <laughs> uh, sorry, I, I get easily distracted. Uh, Me too. 
so as as we move forward, I think it's going to be critical that we have an idea of what some of those questions are. Uh, we begin performing those, and so when the county has completed their due diligence and the le legislature begins uh, begins their discussion, then um, I think you'll recall that the town, uh, you know, a critical component of this from the county's perspective is the town uh, is a is a uh, in in full support of this, and um, and so I think I think. As we'll discuss here in a little bit, I think your discussion and your support was kind of contingent on the county completing their due diligence. So, there it is again. The Chatham Park Special Assessment District. Um, just a, a just a, a background on special assessment. The districts basically they're not new. They've uh, statutorily been around for about 50 years. They're used in a lot of other states. Um, Mr. Messick indicates that there have been some smaller ones that have been used locally in Kit Crow. Um, I'll admit I haven't, I haven't done the homework to know where they've been used here locally, but it wouldn't surprise me. It's not uncommon for a special assessment district to be applied towards something like a sidewalk or a curb or some other, um, on the local level, some relatively small project where you have some, some properties that will benefit, some localized properties that will benefit from a specific improvement and the cost for those improvements are then apportioned to the localized benefiting properties as opposed to the entire town. That's, that's dumbed down beyond yeah, what it might even really be, but that's typically how they're done, whether it's in Pittsburgh or whether it's in any other community that I've worked with. That's typically how they're done. Uh, they will, they'll typically allow the, the, a local government to assess the cost of providing an improvement against a particular property local governments typically front the cost of the improvements. So um, in a conventional sense, uh, say for instance, go back to that localized example of a sidewalk, the local government will let the, you know, there's, there's a process used for establishing a special assessment district, but in terms of the project itself, the local government will pay for that project and then they'll collect the money to help pay off the cost of that project by assessing the cost of the project against those particular properties. So again, that's a very conventional mean, uh, means of, uh, of, of moving on a special assessment. The costs of the improvement are paid back to the local government over a period of time, generally with interest, whatever fees might be established. <coughs> and when the General Assembly has authorized local governments to pledge new assessments as security for revenue bonds, and I think that legislation actually actually has been has occurred uh, in recent years, 2008, renewed in uh, renewed in 2013 and it's just kept going. I think we'll finally sunset, it's next scheduled to sunset in 2018. The statute uh, 9A uh, allows counties to make certain improvements and that's what we're talking about here um, would be the statute that speaks towards uh, counties making special assessments uh, and establishing special assessment districts. There's an Article 10A, and the A corresponds to the new legislation. Uh, there's a 10A, which is specific towards municipalities, and municipalities have a separate set of, uh, of improvements that they can make. Uh, in this case, we're talking about counties, and I didn't, I didn't include this necessarily as a bullet, uh, and we can get into it in a little bit, but essentially the reason for talking about the special assessment district occurring on a county-wide basis is that the, as it stands right now, the vast majority of the 7,000 acres are located in our extraterritorial jurisdiction, but they're located in Chatham County. And the existing statutes do not allow, and Mr. Messick can step in here, but based on, based on my diligence, the, uh, the existing statutes do not allow for special assessment districts, uh, for municipalities to establish special assessment districts uh, unless the property is annexed or unless it's part of their corporate property. Um, and I don't, I don't think any, I don't think anything has, has changed that recently. So what we're talking about here is Chatham County actually being the arena at this point in time until annexation occurs, and that's a whole separate other discussion. So these certain improvements, and I've got a list of them, and I, I think I copied off, uh, I copied off for you, uh, and, and these, and I could have probably put, I could have probably italicized some of these to separate out exactly what these what these certain improvements are but um, constructing 
and I won't read all these word for word, but constructing, reconstructing, paving, paving, widening, otherwise building and improving streets, and installing curves and gutters. And that's 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 a pretty common one. Um, same thing, but for public streets. Here, it allows for water systems. And this, uh, uh, in this, it's uh, essentially wastewater, but it allows for septic tank systems, um, other on-site collection or disposal facilities or systems. So it allows for sewer treatment. Um, 9A allows for sewer treatment. Uh, storm sewer and drainage systems. Fred looked up and paid particular attention there. Uh, and he furrowed his eyes, furrowed his eyebrows a little bit. Uh, and, and then here, uh, probably not applicable to us, uh, Jordan Lake suddenly, unless maybe the storm would were to cause a uh, weather condition, but uh, beach erosion control, water, hurricane protection works. Chatham Park proposes a special assessment district with some variations. Again, this is particular to counties. Uh, the variations aren't currently allowed in the current statute. Uh, the most notable variation is the assessments that uh, would be uh, would be placed against the benefiting properties uh, would then be used to reimburse the developer for whatever public improvements are incurred by the developer. And this is my reimbursements for improvements. <coughs> Reimbursements for improvements would be approved in advance. We're very fortunate to have Indira Everett from Duke Energy with us tonight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I was in here going, but I'm going back for a while. Indira, we're going to we're going to hold your feet to the fire here. <laughs> You're also fortunate to have hard copies up here. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, y'all don't have hard copies. But I think we can continue. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Okay. I left off with uh, I left off. Uh, reimbursements for improvement. Reimbursements for improvements to be approved in advance. In other words, the any improvements that need to be made um, under this process would uh, would have to be approved. Would have to be agreed upon in advance by some by some legal uh, mechanism or tool that's allowable under the statute. Uh, and then finally, the developer would incur the total cost of the special assessment. It would be a it would be a cost neutral proposition for the county and for the town. Uh, there would be no borrowing required by the county or the town for this. Um, and it's my understanding too that the reimbursements would not uh, would not be made at 100%. They would not be actually seeking for 100% of the reimbursement. Brian, could I figure this way through the mic? That's true. Only the $500. Is that a one time, one year, or is that? But I'm just one residential property, one time, $500 per year. Yeah. And an average of $500. So some would be less, some would be more. So, what happens with the public improvements that uh, that are completed? Um, they would be uh, as much as as practicable. Uh, they would be conveyed to the entity that owns the improvement. So, I think in some cases, in theory, if you have a state road, the state would be receiving the road. Um, if we had, if we were looking at water and sewer improvements, there would be some discussion, and then whoever would be responsible. Uh, for owning those improvements, those would be conveyed to those improvements. For example, uh, let's just talk about, in theory, uh, a wastewater collection system that would be established uh, under this process. 
um, that would eventually be conveyed to uh, to the town or to whatever entity that would, whether, whether it be a regional facility or basically whatever entity actually owned that wastewater facility. Um, that again would have to be formalized, memorialized in a legal instrument. Again, all of that stuff has to be discussed. Then. There would be one special assessment district for all of Chatham Park. They're looking at all 7,000 acres as a special assessment district, but it would actually be mechanized um, as the property develops. So if there was a, a particular area uh, that was that was developed, um, the payment cycle apparently would be um, would be operationalized. That 25-year payment cycle would be operationalized at the beginning of that property's development. That's what's been put on the table this morning. And then, and then, as as uh, commissioner, uh, as uh, commissioner uh, mentioned, then the average would be an annual of $500 now, like with a cap to residential properties, and that's I believe in 2016 dollars. So then, depending on how long this would take. Uh, you know, we could have any number, uh, you know, essentially the value of money might cause that to go up, not necessarily anything, my understanding, project related would cause that to go up. Commercial property would also have a cap, but that would be likely based on square footage of commercial property, um, and it would be mechanized different than residential property would as far as the cap is concerned. So where are we now? The county has received uh, at least two presentations that I'm aware of from the developer most recently a week ago uh, during the county's work session. Uh, and the county in turn uh, asked some questions uh, last week uh, and I don't believe that there was a formal vote but it was my impression talking to the county manager and one of the board members that the county is currently, county staff is exercising due diligence on their part of the process. Um, and. Uh, essentially, it's going to kind of come down to for them the cost issues, um, whether or not their bond ratings would be affected, um, whether it would be cost, in, what it, whether it in fact would be cost neutral for them, and then, uh, and then obviously the legislative issue too as well. Um, there hasn't been, to my knowledge, any discussion at the legislative level for this, at least in a formal manner. I'm not quite sure how that, as I sit here and talk to you, I'm not quite sure how that will be processed. Um, that's going to be something else that, that we'll need to keep an eye on and be aware of. Um, and we may be asked for some opinions uh, at that point in time, but I don't know when that will be processing. Uh, the town has allowed the county to perform due diligence. Uh, I'm sorry, I misspelled diligence, so I apologize for that. Uh, the, um, the, uh, now what, what, that, what essentially that means is that you recall is, is that that you, you allowed the county to uh, go through a fact finding on, on special assessment districts, how would it affect them, um, possibly how it would affect us, um, and then the discussions would occur on our end as to how it would affect us. But then the county would then um, come back to the town essentially with a, I don't know whether it would be a formalized report, but, uh, but with, you know, with, a, with the state of this issue, uh, in terms of, of whether or not it would it would be willing to move forward, you then would in turn uh, be empowered at that point in time to provide your formal or informal or whatever level of support you feel is necessary at that point in time. So, when when someone says you provided unanimous support for it, that's kind of a qualified statement. You've provided unanimous support for the process at this point. Nothing's been set in stone or put in motion like that. Thank you for clarifying that. Legislation will have to be introduced, as I mentioned earlier, to modify the current uh, general statute. That legislation, again, would correspond to, uh, to how the payments would be processed back to, uh, back to the developer. Uh, legislation would also need to be modified in order to, uh, in order to allow for private monies to be used um, to help uh, finance uh, some of the public improvements. Uh, in, in the materials that we included in your packet, uh, there were a number of things uh, that uh, Mr. Messick had emailed to you earlier, and I, um, I again copied in your packet all those materials with the exception of the uh, school of government piece, which I think I even, that might be the third time you received that. I placed it again on your, on your tables this evening. Um, but in one of the pieces of 
No, it wasn't for Mr. Messick actually. The piece, that, the piece of legislation that shows the red mark items was in um, the packet of information that was that I received and I think uh, Mayor Perry and Commissioner Bonnets received at a legislative breakfast uh, that was held with our, uh, a couple of our representatives uh, and uh, there was a red line, there's a red line copy of, of, uh, of 9A uh, that, that actually outlines the proposed changes to this point. Uh, so that gives you a bit more formal background about how that will be processed at the legislative level, at least as it stands right now until I hear otherwise. So, check in a little bit first. Is this clear, lot clear as mud at this point? Is it, is it a lot of this, you know, going to take me if you've heard this before? I think with something like this, there's certainly no shame in repeating it for a third time. And if you have to ask any questions on it, there's no shame in asking any question up to this point. Um, but uh, in terms of the special assessment district and what what was what is currently allowed, and the special assessment district in terms of what Chatham Park and the developers proposing um, that be changed with this process, um, that is a, a very nutshell overview of. Of, uh, of where we're at at this point. Um, moving forward, some considerations that I might know would be uh, which improvements. You saw a list of improvements that, that can be made pursuant to the existing statute. Um, which improvements would be contemplated for the special assessment district? In other words, how specifically would Chatham Park um, make improvements for the special assessment district? We've heard in a very general sense, roads, water, sewer. Um, and then at the, the joint meeting the other night, they mentioned a few things. Um, we haven't seen anything formal on it, so I think there's 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 more discovery to be made on that on that uh, on that front. Transition. Um, we mentioned conveyance earlier. How legally uh, would this infrastructure be transitioned to the town? What would be the instrument used for that? Um, would it be an intergovernmental uh, governmental agreement between the county and the town? Um, there's uh, there's a bit of work, I think, on, on all of our parts in, in determining the best way to go about that if we get to that point. And uh, yeah, I guess that those are the considerations that I have. You may have others. I know I've heard I know I've heard in the past that uh, there was some discussion or some speculation as to whether or not schools. Uh, whether or not schools uh, could be a part of uh, could be a part of a special assessment district reimbursement. My understanding of the statute as it's written right now is that's not, for better or worse or indifferent, it's not something that's part of the existing statutory language. Whether or not that would change or whether, they, whether the developer has introduced some other mechanism to make that happen, uh, I'm not aware. Certainly infrastructure that would help serve schools um, I believe, you know, in theory, would be in play for this. But would there actually be money, for example, to uh, to build a new school building or build new school facilities? That I'm not as clear on. My first glance, my first sort of prima facie glance, as a lawyer might say, there's no, there's nothing I can see that, that gives us the ability to do that right now. My question would be. I could see that it maybe it could be used to pay for parks that are going to be attached to the school. My question would be, could they do that for a private school that would not be, I guess it would still be open to the public after hours, but that would be my concern. Okay. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. And I think that's part of, I think that's part of what I want to do is if you guys have any is there anything that keeps you awake at night with this? If there's anything you want us to follow back on, um, th this would be a good time to do it. Those are the two that are going to sit in my head right now, and there may very well be others that you guys have thought of and have been asked by the public as well. Okay. Can I take their number two? This has got nothing to do with infrastructure being accepted by the town. These will be, to the extent that these are infrastructure elements that will be maintained by the town forever, it's going to be the same process you've always had. The developer builds them, turns them over to you when it's complete, you accept them, you keep on going. It's got nothing to do with this. This is how it's paid for. Uh, the developer's going to pay for it, right. just like he's been doing now. And if I understand you right, though, I think 
I think if this were part of the conventional uh, master plan and the, the conventional master plan, uh, assuming that the property was annexed and all the development was taking place with the annexed property, then, then there would be a pretty easy transition. I think in this case, what we're talking about is the, the, the development, uh, as I understand it, if the development is taking place in the county, then the county would have to convey that over to the town unless the annexation actually occurred before that conveyance. So I don't... Well, the annexation can, apply, can occur as soon as it's applied for. Under the master plan, they have to apply for it when they propose a subdivision, propose a site plan, propose these improvements, in fact. So you'll be able to annex it as soon as it's done, I mean, before it's done. Um, so that's not the issue. Okay. Well, I mean, in a, you know, there again, this one wasn't this one wasn't necessarily something that I originated. This was something that. And even if it is in the ETJ, you still can accept the waterline in the ETJ. You do it all the time. You they, got them out there. Fair enough. But this will be a, this will be something that the county will be talking about. That that piece right there. Now we can you know, that that well, may be a good response, but that is something that. The I think it's irrelevant to them too because they're not going to have any water sewer lines. It's going to be town. I do think it's important to make sure that we have some say in the quality because um, if we're going to be the ones maintaining it, maybe it will be built in, but I think we can't assume that we have to make sure. Of course you're going to assume that, because Fred's going to have to approve every plan for any infrastructure that they, they propose to build. It's going to be a town street, it's going to, or if it's a DOT street, the DOT will have to approve it. It's going to be the same as it was done, we were talking about six months ago. It's mm -hmm. no different. And to a certain extent, I mean, to piggyback on that, to a certain extent, that sort of process is already taking place, for example, with the north side water system improvements. Those, uh, those contemplated improvements, the, the elevated tank, the, the, the distribution system, uh, the valves, a lot of that, a lot of those improvements currently, um, you know, are technically located within the ETJ and not, and have not been actually annexed yet. Fred, Fred and the Sultan still have uh, and are engaging in a review of that. In fact, your elbows deep in that right at the moment. So. If, so. if I could just interject my two cents worth. On the red line version of the statute, you can see uh, the proposed changes to this. And, and of course, all of this is dependent upon the legislature changing the law. If the legislature doesn't see fit to do this, none of this is discussion is worthwhile at all. But the, on par page two, Item number five under 153A210.4 is the key to this whole um, scenario. All of these other one through four allow for public financing of infrastructure. Geo bonds, uh, revenue, revenues from the town general fund, uh, revenue bonds, uh, those are public, in, public expenditures. The proposal is to allow funds from private or third parties to be used to fund these infrastructure improvements. And then on the next page, the C, to allow reimbursement from assessments, is the other half of the, of the key to this whole uh, scenario. If public private funds can be used to pay for these improvements, and if assessments can be levied as a result of those private funds, this would allow the, re the developer to advance those private funds to be reimbursed from the assessments. It's, that's, I mean, the rest of this is uh, minor stuff, but those are the two key elements of this whole proposal uh, as Chatham Park has proposed. And if they don't fly with the legislature, then none of this is going to happen. Okay. Any other questions? And all the other examples in, in North Carolina have all been with public financing, and they're not proposing that. There is going to be a cost. Uh, the county already collects your taxes. It has all the sends out all the tax bills, collects all the taxes. Assessments would be as a part of the tax bill. Um, so that it's logical for the county to collect the assessments since they're collecting your taxes. If you were to do your own assessments, for example, you'd have to have a parallel system to the tax system. And so there would be even more cost to do that. Uh, the county's going to have to have software to be able to handle that and, and develop response to make sure that the county doesn't have to eat that. But uh, 
I mean, that's, the, that's the reason for the county, primarily, is they collect the taxes. Is, it, is this going to possibly open the door for other developers that come into the uh, town or county? And this, if they want to recoup some of their money, are they going to be able to come to us for a special assessment? Well, sure, they can. You can't have a you can't have a provision that only applies to one person. That, that would be established through a separate a process that's separate from this that you're talking about. You, you, I mean, if somebody if somebody had a project that you and, and the law applied and you wanted to pursue it, then yeah, you could consider that. Sure. Well, there certainly have been laws written for specific companies in this state. I think that this is a proposal for a statewide um, change to the law, not a local act. Understood. Can a parcel be subject to more than one special assessment district? Sure. Now, go back to the traditional example that, that Brian was talking about, the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's been 20 years since the town did that because the board does not like to tell people they have to pay for an improvement. Uh, and so, it, but it hasn't been done very often, but you can, and you can probably should consider it at least as an option. You can tell if you get a sidewalk in front of your house that you have been specially benefited by that public improvement. But, and, and it's reasonable to expect that you should have to pay for it rather than somebody on the other side of town have to pay for it out of general fund revenues. But previous boards have been reluctant to do that. They have seen it's been more of the practice that general fund pays for, regardless of whether it benefits that particular property owner, that street, that community, that neighborhood. Um, but it doesn't have to be. So you can have a special assessment for a sidewalk or a street and still have something like this as well. I can't really imagine why, because this will be brand new infrastructure, and why would you need a sidewalk added? I mean, later on, you could have a, a traditional assessment if you wanted to do that. Do you have to establish a district to have an assessment? The, the district is just a territorial geographic area. Mm -hmm. So sure, you, once you determine that there's an improvement, and once you determine that some area has specially benefited from that, then it becomes, quote, a district, whether it's both sides of the street, 7,000 acres, it's all the same thing. Can the county establish a district within the municipality no. without no. a local agreement? No. You mentioned that um, the county would do it because it uh, <coughs> Majority of the property is outside of town limits, municipal corporate limits. That, that's one reason. Okay. Is there another? Tax collection. They have the mechanism to collect the assessment because they have the mechanism and authority to collect the taxes. Can the municipality establish a district providing that the county perform that collection? Well, yeah, they collect your have alarms, right. but yeah, they probably could collect yes. your assessments okay. as well. Yes, if you look at that, there's a, as I said before, ten. There's the next, the next pair of uh, the next ten uh, A actually speaks directly to municipalities and, and it has a special assessments for critical infrastructure needs specifically for municipalities. And so there's a separate process that, that is allowable for that. Um, you know, again, in this case, and, 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 and even in that, even in that structure, I think for all practical purposes, if the if the town did decide to establish a, an essential, a special assessment district for its own purposes within its own corporate boundaries, in all likelihood, the county would be the ones administering that process anyway, because they currently administer our tax collection. I mean, unless I mean, conceivably we could go ahead and do that on our own, but wouldn't be my recommendation that we do that. Um, in this case, I don't. I, I think that that answer has to be nuanced a little bit. I don't think in this case, based on what I have, my conversations with the developers, is, is that it's not just for tax collection. It's, it's because these, <coughs> these projects are not in the corporate boundaries of the town of Pittsburgh. Okay. And so for, for that planning to move forward, uh, those, especially, those assessments would be applied to those properties that are outside, currently outside of the corporate boundaries. 
I think the other rationale to, to go with that is that if they were going to build a large thoroughfare type street that might go into areas of their project that are not quite ready for development, are not quite ready for a site plan, or quite ready for a subdivision, but yet could qualify under the assessment provision, even though it's all going to be held in advance until it is developed. Uh, then that would be the rationale for trying to do this through the county and, and because it would, that part of it would be the EPJ. Even though a phase that would be, you know, contemporary or coterminous with the town's boundaries would be, could be annexed because it's going to be in a, in a site plan or subdivision. But if that thoroughfare keeps on going uh, and, it, and it won't be, it'll be a later phase before it's ever actually developed, then that would be a reason to do it through the county. Are there other questions for Mr. Messick or Mr. Rusbeck? I just have one, if you could clarify one, each, one thing that was said. Commissioner Fioco asked, could a town establish special assessment? It's true. And you were indicating yes. Mm -hmm. So, but this article says just of a county. Well, this is Chapter 153A okay. of the General Statutes. That deals with counties. Chapter 168 deals with municipalities. So, okay. Article 10 is a part, I mean, Article 9A is a part of 153A. Article 10 is a part of 160A. He's got to get the, another chapter of the book. Okay. This, this, is, this is what has been discussed at this point in time because it's all, the game is all taking place in the county at this point. So that's why, that's why we have 9A. If we have been talking about the town, we'd be talking about 10A. The, 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 the differences are not significant. Um, I think it would be really helpful if you could compile a list of all the things that might be developed through this model of an assessment district. Um, you know, conceivably, can see things that might conceivably be developed that are eligible for. Yeah. I think all, all of them would not occur until somebody initiated it. The way the statute is currently written in that slide, that's what's eligible. Well, okay, because and I'm looking for clarification because you know I start digging in myself and I'm going to session laws and house bills um, that lead me to this long list of things. Mm -hmm. Well, it is it is a long list: streets, curbs, gutters, uh, sidewalks, water systems, wastewater systems. I'm, I'm looking at something that's telling me airport facilities and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, internet infrastructure? Beach erosion? Uh, that's going to be open. Infrastructure? Listed? Yes. That's the last one. Yeah. Go back to the list. Oh, yeah. And in this. And case, what I wonder is, like, how much say will the town have in how that money is spent? You know, which projects get the voice and which projects get selected? It, it's their money, first of all. So, we're going to be maintaining it. Well, you're doing it now. You're going to maintain this street in front of the medical office building, and it was their money right, to pay for. Right, but that's different than an airport or something like that. I just would be curious to know if we're going to have some voice. Uh, what's most important to the developer might not be what the town thinks is most important. Well, then the town wouldn't accept it. Okay, that's the question. Well, and I think wouldn't accept it as part of the special assessment, not accept it for maintenance once it's constructed. Right. So initially. Oh boy. If it's all, the, 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 the rationale for that thinking is that everything in Chatham Park, by the time it gets developed, will be annexed into the town. They have an obligation right. to make a request, and I can't imagine us not taking it. And does this apply to things that are in gated communities or private schools? Or are we going to be required to maintain things that are in gated communities? The, these are public improvements. And you could have a sewer line that goes through a gated community, or you could have a sewer line that goes through a private school. It, it's entirely possible. You would have to have an easement to go through it, but you would you would you would you have made you have public improvements on private property all over the place. I understand that, but I don't want to see the town maintaining a park that's in a private community, for example. That really has nothing to do with this. This is talking about how it, how it gets paid for. Uh, if, it, if there's a private park, then presumably you would never accept it as a, part of, as a public improvement. Okay. Just 
clarify. Um, I just follow this up with my list of things. If you could confirm, um, Brian or Paul, what I'm reading from is 159-103. That's which probably gives a fine. list that makes reference to. Yeah, you know, 160A. <coughs> We're talking about 160 days. He's on the public finance check. Oh, yeah. So the, where I'm getting the list that I think qualifies for items to be financed by the Special Assessment District is 159-103 via 159-48. There's a long, it makes a long list of these number bulleted items. And this this does say the schools are eligible. Yes. It's not what the school government is saying. So, yeah, I'd like confirmation that all of those items are eligible. What was it? the section number? One. Uh, 159-48 and 159-103. And I'm getting there through session law 2008-165. Three deals with what you can use geo bonds for. Yeah, and you could use geo bonds to pay for this in the traditional infrastructure improvement scenario. So if you if the get if the government were to issue geo bonds and use them for schools, for example, it could do so under 159. This says that if you were to do that, then the government could recoup some of the cost of that through the special assessment infrastructure district. But that's not to say that a, and I guess theoretically, if you wanted to hire, if this law were to change, then you, and put some private individual wanted to build school, then they could reduce the cost of that partially through special assessment. But that doesn't mean that the local government unit has to accept a proposal for a private developer to build anything, or to qualify a particular expenditure for this recoupment, reimbursement process. That, that's up to the local government. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think there was a proposal to build schools. Even though you asked. Well, given how expensive schools are to build and given the $500 annual limitation, I'm wondering, and given the fact that Chatham Park does not wish to completely recoup their costs, I'm thinking that they won't. Well, Chatham County has seen fit to try to recoup the cost, at least partially, of school construction by charging an impact fee of $3,500 per house. So the county has never seen fit to try to collect 100% of the cost of the schools anyway. So I mean, I'm not sure that they should cast too many stones here. And 15948 is just the purposes for which you can issue bonds. I think legislation's linked those items to a special assessment district. Yeah, that's that's not any of the information that I've seen at the school of government. It's if you review the article that you have from the school of government, there's no reference made towards schools with but with regard to special assessment districts. Now if there's uh, I'm willing to go back through it, but this is you know based on based on what we found through the school of government, I haven't seen that. That's at odds. Other further questions? Mm -hmm. Mr. Bonnet? Um, well, we're on the, while we're on the subject of this, just to, to be clear, I asked, uh, can communication infrastructure be uh, paid for through such an assessment? 
in what infrastructure? Communication infrastructure. For example? Internet. Fiber. Well, that's a whole other, uh, internet is a whole other issue. I think as, as you're probably aware, there's, there are, there have been limitations that the courts have placed down with uh, municipal ability to, whether it be county or local government, to allow, uh, to have um, uh, public uh, internet infrastructure and to use it to pay for public internet infrastructure. Um, whether, the, whether or not the developer would seek to be reimbursed for uh, its portion of the public, uh, its portion of, of internet that they make available, or internet infrastructure they make available, I'm not quite sure where that would be applied. Uh, the short answer under special assessments is I don't see anything in the special assessment district uh, legislation that uh, are statutes that, that allow for infrastructure at this point in time. And again, like I said, the courts have kind of come down pretty hard on the ability for governments to do that uh, following the experience of some of the others that have tried to establish public infrastructure utilities for internet. Um, this has been a really very helpful con com uh, conversation for me, and uh, Brian, I, I really appreciate your, your presentation. Uh, the thing that I would really like to highlight, um, I, uh, I thank Commissioner Fuller for pointing out the question of quality in installation, and I'm confident that we're mindful of that, and we're going to be monitoring that as these projects get proposed. But once these improvements are made, once they're handed to confer to the town for maintenance, my great concern is how they will be paid for, maintained, and replaced. Um, we're in a situation now where we have significant infrastructure needs, and um, I don't believe we're in a position to replace them ourselves. Well, I mean, keep in mind, when, as this development occurs, they would, they would in theory be adding ad valorem property tax revenue, um, as well as as well as revenue on the enterprise side with, in terms of water and sewer, mm -hmm. and so that would be used to help maintain those facilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, when will we? How, how will this process be sequenced? For example, will we see a specific and detailed list of the improvements before the legislation is proposed? I'd say no. <coughs> yeah, I'm just guessing that they're going to tackle the issue of the legislation first and, mm -hmm. and try, to, try to check that milestone off. And then following that, then, um, then as you have from the, the statute, you know, there's two different copies of, of the statute that you have. Um, there's a process for petitioning, and uh, what, what would happen next is essentially the county would receive a petition from the developer, and it would have to outline what is part of the special assessment district at that point in time. And so I would think at the time of the petition is when we would see uh, formally, I, I think discussion-wise, we would have an idea before that, but at least formally, it would be no later than that. Okay. Um. And so, will how will that sequence uh, align or not before or after the small area plans? Uh, the the first slug of small area plans. Yeah, I think we're going to see the small area plans. Um, I, I would I would be guessing that we're going to see the small area plans um, before the completion of this petitioning process to establish a special assessment district. Okay. Will we see the small area plan? I, I think you were told that you'd see a small area plan perhaps in May. The legislature, I don't know when they meet, but it, it'll be the summer before that's done. Mm -hmm. And even even after that, even if the law has changed, it's going to take a while to you know to figure out the, the details with the county, uh, whether the county is willing to entertain it at all. So you're going to see a small area plan way before you see anything from this. Okay.
from what I understand, the small area plants are going to be grouped. I, I had originally thought we were going to be seeing 27 or however many there were, um, one at a time. But apparently this first group is going to be inclusive of about seven or eight different ones. cost of maintenance and replacement um, and the uh, reassuring reminder that the ad valorem taxes and, or fees and uh, sewer and water uh, access fees, what are they called? Their access fees? There's access and capital recovery fees for water and sewer. Um, so we have the mechanisms in place, um, but um, you know, at some point we're, we're, we're to be asked to support legislation that will result in construction of, main, of infrastructure. We don't know the extent of it. We're going to be asked to pay for, uh, to uh, take on ownership of it, and future citizens will be asked to maintain it and, and replace it someday. And um, I, I just would like to go in with eyes wide open about that. Um, we've already seen some infrastructure like the sewer and such that uh, uh, I feel makes a very compelling argument for having detailed uh, financial projections for all of those mechanisms that you mentioned, the ad valorem tax, the access and capital recovery fees, and the others that I haven't mentioned. No. And as, as, those, as those details are put together? Yeah, and you will have those to review. Okay. And it's got to be the, that would be the same you know, the same issue with any details associated with this. What we're doing is is setting the legislative table for this special assessment district to occur. Mm -hmm. and if that legislation, is, as Mr. Messick indicated, if that legislation is actually uh, if that legislation actually has formal legs to stand on, then we'll see. We'll see discussions taking place on how uh, specific infrastructure will fall into this process. Mm -hmm. So that at that point in time, as I as I said before, it would it would appear to me that we'll um, if we if we don't already have some conversations taking place as to what will be a part of a special assessment district, what specific improvements would be part of a special assessment district. If that conversation never took place ahead of time, which I doubt severely that it would. Not take place ahead of time. We would, at minimum, uh, have an ability to see that happen within the petitioning process because the petition has to, by statute, contain that information. It has to, it has to contain a list. It has to contain a list and but uh, not details. It has, contain, it has to also contain the financing, which in this case, oh. which in this case would be the developer essentially paying for the cost of the infrastructure. Okay. Well, an estimate of the cost of the project, at least, and um, that, that, that's what's required in the petition. And then an estimate of the, the proportion of that cost that they propose to collect from assessments. It could be 50 percent, or it could be 30 percent, or 60 percent. But if they, you know, they said that they didn't want to do 100 percent. And um, you know, regardless of this, it, you know, if there is a, a, a subdivision that comes in in Channel Park. It's going to have, you know, implications as far as water, sewer, streets are concerned. Uh, I'm not sure that you're entitled to know how much it costs the developer to put that water, sewer, street in. Uh, you can estimate the cost of maintenance in the future, but between the fact that it's given to you, you know, debt free, and the fact that you're going to have property taxes from perpetuity, I mean, what other information do you want to know? Well, I, I don't I don't view that as as a cornucopia. I don't I don't view that as a, a, a bounty unfolding. I view that as a set of encumbrances to future generations, um, and um, I take that very very seriously because we have infrastructure right now we can't pay to replace. Am I wrong? Uh, well, I think I think Mr. Mess makes a good point to that point, and I think that the, the infrastructure that we you know, in your words, we can't pay to maintain this infrastructure that the town took debt 
in order to either build or improve or make repairs to. Mm -hmm. And as I've indicated in previous budgets, uh, a lot of the deficit that we've seen, 14% last year of the deficit that we saw on the enterprise side was geared towards paying off deficit that was related to debt in order to make those infrastructure improvements in addition to some operational costs, which are essentially at that point in time were balanced out. The debt was the debt was taking up the debt and, and low revenue was taking up the lion's share of, of that deficit. In this case, as Mr. Messick indicated, the developer is paying for the cost of establishing this infrastructure. It, it doesn't get any cheaper for the town than that. We're we're already one step ahead of the game in having that infrastructure actually installed at a cost neutral standpoint to us. Mm -hmm. Then it becomes operations and maintenance O and M where we begin to do things, where we begin to actually depreciate the, the assets and structure, how we maintain and how, uh, you know, how we, we, we make sure that stuff uh, lasts longer than it's lasted up to this point previously, which, again, will be easier to do when we're not burdened by uh, legacy debt costs that were established with the initial in, in infrastructure. Okay. And the town has always had limited resources, and each board is... A, do your budgets, you have to allocate those limited resources That's in a particular right. fashion. That's right. You may choose not to spend any money on rehabbing the sidewalks in town. And apparently, we well, always have done that and spent it somewhere else. So, I mean, you're always going to have choices and you're sure. always going to, you're never going to have enough money to do everything you want to do. Uh, so, you're always going to have those issues. And, you know, in the past, the town's fixed what it had to fix and put a little bit aside and take some baby steps occasionally and, mm -hmm. um, and, and and, you know, unless something changes, that's probably the way it's going to be for the future, too. I mean, if, we, if we didn't have any development moving forward, if you'll recall, you weren't on the board at the time, but the previous board wrestled with the issue of, of water and sewer costs uh, and, and the rate structure. And we worked with the School of Government on right sizing our rate structure. And the rest of the board will recall the projections that we received at that point in time. Um, all things equal showed uh, some positive growth, uh, even dare I say surplus in, in future years if we didn't make um, drastic operational um, expenditures to the system. So if we weren't if we weren't to do anything right now, if we were to have any sort of development right now, um, in theory, based on what we found, that we should be uh, we should be completely. Um, solvent plus uh, in future years, given that a lot of the debt falls away. Um, that said, um, you know, value of money and, and continued depreciation and emergencies and zombie attacks and things that we can't foresee um, probably can eat that up pretty quick, to be fair. Um, but, but the idea of development is that future development should help pay for operations and maintenance of things that get installed during that development. Absolutely. So exist, you know. So so increased fee, you know, increased increased utility revenues, both on the fee side, uh, but also on the uh, on the commodity side, mm -hmm. uh, are in theory supposed to help balance that out. Mm -hmm. Likewise, ad valorem will help balance out the general fund side. Now, if, the, if all that development were to take place, and this is where a lot of governments, this is where a lot of municipalities get in trouble, is if all that if, if all of that infrastructure were to be installed. Um, at, at the cost and at the debt of the, of the municipality. Uh, so in other words, if we were to borrow the money, if we were to, if, if we were to sell bonds, borrow the money, install infrastructure, and the development did not follow, then yeah, that's, that's a problem. Um, you know, in that case, I think we're all, uh, we're all really scratching our heads and becoming uh, sleepless over that issue. In this case, what we've said at the very beginning, from the very beginning, is that this development is supposed to be a cost-neutral standpoint for the town, and mm -hmm. that we were going to expect, and as as, uh, as Commissioner Farrell has said a number of times, uh, you know, the developer the developer needs to pay its share of, of development costs for this, and so that's that's been our marching orders from staff perspective, um, and it will be until somebody tells me otherwise. Great. That's, 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 that's very reassuring. Thank you. Um, because uh, I, I just, uh, I guess I'm skeptical of the idea that the continued growth can always pay for uh, maintenance and replacement. 
of the infrastructure that's needed. And um, I didn't in any way mean to slight anyone, oh, their management ability. Are you kidding me? Those when I said I, I don't feel like we mind. can afford to. Absolutely. I understand we are working mightily to maintain what we've got. Um, but replacement is necessary. The sewage treatment plant, it's, I mean, that's, it's on the table. And um, I, it, I think there's, you know, it's, it's, I don't mean to blur the lines here, but the question of the sewage line to, to Sanford uh, comes to mind. And um, I continue to wonder if we can't find a way to take care of our own needs and perhaps some incremental amount that Chatham Park would need uh, without uh, creating infrastructure that, if anything soured in a relationship with Sanford, would be a pipeline to nowhere. Um, that is a big concern for me. And us taking on that debt. Are there others who have any thoughts to chime in? I hear a lot of sighing. <laughs> well, I can say that, yeah, the Sanford option is contingent on a very good agreement. So that it does protect us against the souring relationships. So I think it's critical that we negotiate a very good arrangements with them. Because um, I think it's the, the best way for us to get a lot of capacity that we can grow into. I think John's point is well taken in, in that in that we do need to consider future costs and if this if this development were coming in in the next two years I'd be I'd be frightened. The idea that we've got a good spread on it means that we can uh, Create enough contingencies uh, and watch the the budget process as it comes in, as those sales taxes, as the <coughs> impact fees, etc., come in. Uh, I don't know if governmental accounting leaves a position for a sinking fund or something that anticipates those future costs. Is that what fund balance is? Well, that's a, a as, it, as the budget order is currently structured or reserved. We have a reserve uh, account that's currently established that takes in all of our fees that are related to, I don't say, in, they're not impact fees technically, but to our franchise and our connection fees um, help build up what's called a reserve fund, and that helps that helps for planning for future infrastructure, for making contributions of contributions towards building future infrastructure. And right now, it's not a very sophisticated fund in terms of how it disperses money. In this next budget process, I think that has to change a little bit. Nancy and I started talking about um, started talking about how money is actually dispersed from our reserves, as opposed to right now it's it's somewhat clearly defined in terms of how the reserves come in. We have we have one line that essentially goes towards helping to maintain um, maintain and uh, develop our treatment systems, both on the water and wastewater side. We have another line uh, that's collected. Um, that uh, helps in maintain and improve our distribution systems both on the water and wastewater side. When once that hits the reserve, uh, once that hits our reserves, there's, it's not really clear how then it's dispersed from there to, to help do things like maintenance and future planning and things like that. And that's, I think, something that uh, that we're going to have some third party input on. And the only other way to do it is for you all to have the wherewithal, the commitment to appropriate money either from the general fund or from the enterprise fund into these reserves. And that means you got to either take it from something else that you'd rather spend the money on uh, or generate more revenues to be able to put it in the reserve fund. So it, it's easy to say you have one and you are, or you ought to have one. It's The proof is in the pudding and when you all have to take money away from something else to put it in a reserve fund that might be sitting there for years before you ever uh, have the opportunity to spend it. I mean, that requires a lot of discipline for you all. Yeah, the, I mean, you're right, and the fund balance does, I mean, in a general sense, fund balance does help take care of those things, but it's not, in my mind, it's not a reserve 
fund per se unless you specifically designate it for that purpose. You don't want to build within public accounting, you don't want to build um, surpluses without essentially having a plan for it. And that's that's where a reserve fund comes into play. And uh, you know, it has, as as far as you know, Sanford is concerned, that's a, that's that's a, a good example in that um, when it comes time to actually discussing these these issues with the LGC, as you recall from our meeting with the state a couple of weeks ago, that that how how we actually guarantee those payments from Chatham Park based on the fees, based on the development fees that we'll be collecting. And how we disperse those are going to be critical, I think, to how the LGC approves this. And so um, we'll be working with them over the next few months on how to do that. Um, does the board have further questions? No further questions. I, I, I do just want to put a bow on, on this. My understanding is that the Special Assessment District is a legal process has yet to unfold and, and we don't know whether or not the legislature is going to approve it by which the, this developer says that they'll be making these investments up front and uh, the assessment will, will be collected by the county and the new property owners in Shadow Park will be taxed. It's called an assessment, I recognize, but it's a tax and uh, residences and uh, commerce will be assessed fees. And uh, so the money's not just going to come from nowhere, and, um, but the infrastructure will be built, and there will be nice neighborhoods and nice new commerce and nice new tax revenues generated and new opportunities for us to enjoy life. Have I summarized it correctly? Yeah, I think so. And, and I'm happy to be corrected. Yeah. No, it's... I, I think, as I said at the beginning, I mean, some of the first things that I, and Mr. Messick mentioned as well, there's a lot of work yet to be done on this, and you're going to see that, I mean, as far as the Sanford issue is concerned, too, I mean, you know, to me, it's like leaving a putt short when you're playing golf. I mean, if you leave that putt short, it's never going to go in. If we were to quit the discussion now before having, before following this through to its conclusion, that, that to me, is something I don't think any of us signed up for. Um, we have work to do on this. This has been something that's proposed. There's obviously some milestones that have to be achieved before it could ever uh, come to come to fruition, if, if, if in fact it can. Um, so yeah, there, there are some unknowns with this, and there are some things that are out of, right now, out, frankly, out of our control as far as the legislature is concerned. So until we see some movement on that, as Mr. Messick said, I don't know what, what we can do later. But I think, I think there was some discussion about this in, in the last few meetings as far as checking in with this and um, you know you guys have been part of a couple of discussions in a couple of places and of course this is going to be uh, this could be an issue moving forward and so uh, <coughs> I don't think there's any harm in just you know continuing to check in on this issue. Good. Forward. That's great. Well, I think that's what we've, we've been doing and I think you know step one is the legislature might not pass any new legislation to we'll stop having this conversation. Mm -hmm. If they do then it's going to be dependent upon the county and the town agreeing to establish a district. So yeah, I think there's plenty of opportunity. I mean, clearly, to make a decision to establish a district, we're going to have to have all the information. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. specifically, the list. Of the, I know it's indicated here, but when I was reading through some of this other information, there are other options in reference to a new assessment for the county and for the town, for the uh, county and the town, so to see if they could actually incorporate some of those other things in this. Um, it doesn't, doesn't yeah, they're going to incorporate, they're going to try to incorporate whatever they can legally incorporate under the uh, Well, I'm specifically talking about some capital improvement, mm -hmm. which is a property. All right. <clears throat> then we have received the update and no action is necessary. If the questions are complete, then we'll move to the manager's update on the project. Which you have included in your package.
Okay. Um, we talked a little bit about the Sanford line um, the, uh, and the wastewater treatment plant enhancements. Uh, the mayor and I attended a meeting with representatives from DEQ um, and the Division of Water Infrastructure earlier this month um, to discuss the, the revolving fund loan application. Um, as you recall, we received a notice of intent for the funding improvements that were outlined in that uh, application, which essentially included enhancements to the existing wastewater plant and the extension of a sanitary sewer force main from, uh, from Fifth Row here down to Sanford. Um, the, the meeting uh, outlined, uh, outlined some more steps that have to take place, and we talked a little bit about them uh, this evening. Um, but essentially, uh, we're at the point now where we have to uh, begin to begin to design the project, and I think that's where we start getting into uh, some of the more the weeds of the technical issues. Um, Mr. Royal has had discussions uh, regarding the wastewater treatment plant enhancements and the letting of the contract for that, and we are currently uh, we are currently preparing an RFQ. Uh, for design work on, and I don't know if we ever came to a conclusion on whether we were splitting that between the wastewater plant and the force main, but we will come to that conclusion here in the next day or so. Um, that will be released. We'll, we'll, um, we'll, get, uh, we'll get a design firm on hand, and then that design firm will begin, um, that design firm will begin making, um, uh, making its, putting its plans together. I've got a, Included as an attachment to my report, and we'll get that blown up a little bit for you here. It's not the most. Uh... <coughs> so this one 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 checkpoint has already been established here, and the letter of intent has been uh, has been distributed. Um, that would be the intent from the state to help fund the project. Uh, the uh, applicant, that would be us, has submitted um, the. Um, professional engineering report, um, which is the, the big binder that we received uh, from the Wooten Company that day, and we're trying to, we're trying to actually, that's, that's uh, it's a pretty massive piece that we're putting online, we're going to be putting online, um, if we can, I don't, know, I don't know if you've received an electronic copy of it, but we've been trying to scan that in, and then we'll have that online in the section on the website that contains that information. Um, by June 1st, once we've hired, once we've hired the consultant, um, we'll have uh, the engineering consultant. Then will be submitting an actual engineering report, um, which has all the design information. Uh, between June and November, um, there'll be some back and forth, and then ultimately, if all goes well, the division, the state, would approve that report. Concurrently with that, um, once they've received that that report. Um, we'll be developing, what's not indicated in this, in this flow chart is, is we'll be, be developing intergovernmental agreements. Um, in this case, I think that would be an intergovernmental agreement with Stanford, unless anybody else wants to join in. There could be another intergovernmental agreement type in theory, but I don't think that, uh, I mean, I'm not aware of anything at this point in time that the agreement would, what? Uh, I was just going to clarify that the state has already received the ER slash EID. So this we'll, is the, this we'll is the, on that we'll that's, the, that's the PER, and yeah. so this is the uh, this is the actual design work. Right. Here. So, so by by it. September they would receive that. My bad. I am very sorry about that. So, but but in between in between this in between this this date right now and uh, between an LGC review and approval, then we would be working on the intergovernmental agreement with Sanford. We would also be working out any agreements with um, with the developer. Uh, in terms of the guarantee of, of the loan payments, um, be they through um, uh, impact fees or some other mechanism. Um, LGC would be reviewing that information. It will, we'll be reviewing the professional engineering report. We'll be reviewing the, uh, the, the design information. Um, the, state, the state reviews and approves um, everything, uh, bid and design package, and then um, and then um, once we will let it for bids in this period um, following and after September and then um, executing a contract with the, with the, uh, with the contractor um, for construction, um, 
it would be uh, the division would, would feed back to us uh, an authorization to award. We'd have to wait for that approval. And then at that point in time, we could formally award the contract. The contract would be, uh, the contract would be uh, legitimized at that point. Once we have the contract in place, and then once once the uh, once the LGC has provided its its approval and its vetting, then we would have a promissory note, which would essentially provide the, the wherewithal to complete the project. Construction would take place um, and in early 2018, and then we would begin closing out uh, after that. So, if you if you look at the timeline, we're starting we're basically starting in the present day and. and we're in, we're in this period right here. Uh, the, um, so this is 2016. Before we would actually, it would be 2018, before we would actually begin sometime after February, uh, probably spring, mid-spring, before we would actually begin construction. As well. So a number of checkpoints have to take place. A number of approvals have to be made. Consultants have to weigh in on our wherewithal to do this. Um, the design work all has to fall into place. Uh, the, uh, the, the environmental reviews that are required as part of the process uh, at the state level all have to be cleared. And, uh, and if all goes well, we could be looking at a force made in two years. Clear as, clear as mud at this point. It's, it's, we aren't going to be putting in a force made any time this summer, if that was anybody's worry. I think, I think Commissioner Farrell one time asked me, he was on his way to Sanford one time, and he saw some digging in the right of way, and <laughs> asked me if it had started already. I think, I think that was uh, Duke Energy or somebody who was quite nice. And over to your Any questions on that? We'll have, we'll have more information as this moves forward. Um, the the third third party consultation on finances. Oh, we have, do have a question. Yes, sir. Um, so, where in I don't see it readily easily. Where when in the process do we want to have the interlocal agreement established? Uh, I I think we need the interlocal agreement um, completely. Um, Completely formalized by November 1st at the latest 2016, before the LDC begins its review. Uh, but I, I would I would expect that actually that uh, within I think within this first within these first four months. So um, I would say I would say I'm probably looking at, at June 1st to have a pretty clear picture on what those what the head of government agreement looks like, and then um, to have it completely buttoned up. Um, by the time LGC is able to review. Are you talking about with, uh, with Sanford or are you talking about with John Park? With Sanford. Okay. Yeah, seems I'd say sometime over the next four months, we would have a pretty good idea of what that looks like. It seems to me that's a really important component, clearly, mm -hmm. because it establishes the future yeah. cost of the project. And I'd like to know if it's going you know, to work for us or not sooner because I, I want us to spend a bunch of money you know with design and all that if we can't come to a, an equitable agreement mm -hmm. and I think I think the starting point for us is is an agreement that they've pre previously executed with the town of Goldstein mm -hmm. uh, operationally it would I think an agreement with Sanford would look almost identical to that with the exception of uh, with the exception of some of uh, some of the language in there as about uh, about Sanford's need to um, that um, certain commercial and industrial users. I mean, we, we have a pre-treatment program. We have grid removal. We have things that we'll have in place. We have in place now and we'll have in place with an enhanced system that really won't require Sanford to do the extensive review, for example, that it does with Goldson. So that piece, I think, in the attachment, I've included that that template. That piece, that piece would look uh, a bit different. And then, obviously, too, with the cost, um, the um, you'll recall from the discussions that we had with the Wooten company um, late last summer, um, 
some of the discussions that we've had with Stanford leading up to that had indicated that um, the Stanford, um, the, the rate structure that they would be seeking um, would be would be one piece, but also too that they would be concerned about retiring the debt that they had incurred building their uh, their oversized facility. And it, it's been, I think, the staff's position to this point that we really wanted to minimize or eliminate um, the debt concerns that, that Sanford had um, on its own. In other words, I don't I don't think it's appropriate that, that the town can be a complete party. Um, straight out of the box um, on, on retiring Sanford's debt. That said, I think it's fair um, that there be some consideration based on what we're able to use, but I don't think that it would be appropriate for the town um, to begin paying um, to begin paying for two MGDs worth of debt, worth of capacity reservation, for example, if we're using a fraction. Of that. So I would I would be proposing that we we seek to pay. Um, Essentially, for what we're using, both in terms of reservation and actually what we put through the system. Um, so, initial conversations that we had with Sanford staff, they, they, they sound agreeable to us. Um, so, plugging in those numbers, I think, is going to be the next, the next, uh, the next part of this process, and we'll have help do that. I've received some contacts from um, from Sanford as far as. FAA's financial advisors that they've worked with. Mr. Mazak has a financial advisor that, that he's worked with. There is a firm that's currently working with uh, working with the Jordan Lake Partnership, a, a, an FAA firm that's working with the Jordan Lake Partnership that is also working with Sanford, and I think is really familiar with the lay of the land on that. And so, um, so I'm kind of vetting that information, and I would look forward to having an actual, um, an actual name and contact for us for you guys to, to look at at the next meeting begin to really formulate how we're going to be revealing um, right-sizing our price structure um, in terms of the, the uh, in terms of the force main extension. So thank you. Keeping on, keeping on. There's more, more work to follow this. A question on this report, but this, uh, the force main. Um, <coughs> I guess we were all relieved that Preston had indicated their willingness to guarantee the payment of capital fees. Um, Mr. Messick, does that then go into a development agreement, or is there an, uh, an earlier document? Well, I'm not sure what that, I heard that statement too, and I'm not sure exactly what that means. Um, it can mean different things to different people. Um, and a development agreement is sort of a global kind of thing. Uh, this may very well be a specific agreement between China Park and the town with respect to this particular project. Um, just like you may have a separate uh, agreement with the water tank in, in the northern part of town. Um, I, I, I think this development agreement, you know, even though it's time sensitive in terms of when we start working on that, these things here like this, the time frame may require more specificity and sooner than the development agreement itself. So I guess it could be included in a development agreement, but it's more likely going to be a separate agreement, I would think. There will be an agreement that says Chatham Park commits to guaranteeing payments at this level. I mean, that, that's been, that's on the table, that's been discussed before we can be comfortable moving forward. Well, I'm, you know, guarantees mean different things to different people and I want to make sure how they do that. Correct. Amen. Hmm. You too. Money is good. Oh, it's always good. You know, a guarantee is a contract that says they will they will guarantee a certain amount of development by a specific date or they will pay as if that development did occur and then that revenue then in turn will help guarantee <coughs> the loan for this project. Might, might need a bit more than that. I'm trying to boil this down here. <laughs> <laughs> well, in looking at the Sanford agreement, I, I can't help but wonder um, at the agreement with Goldston. Um, ours is a much more complex. Is it not because of the uh, pump systems and the? Yeah, there there will be more there will be more complex attachments to that document. But as far as as far as ex as far as extending a line. 
um, we pump we pump uh, effluent through the system. Uh, uh, excuse me, we pump untreated wastewater through the system. Uh, the, uh, the, the the city of Sanford then you know, treats it. There will be some other moving parts that, that get inserted into the agreement, but. As far as the language for how all that occurs, this is the starting point for it. There will be things that are added and subtracted from this agreement. Gulson has a pump station that it pumps everything to Sanford. It's the same principle. It's gravity collected into the pump station and then forced on down the line. I, I think I think we do have to, to that point though, in terms of complexity, we do have to resolve um, we do have to resolve any questions of ownership and we need to be sure that we are in fact owning this and not turn I, I mean there's there's no other there's no other authority uh, that that we would be um, there's no other authority that I'm aware of that has stepped forward uh, in terms of owning the forest main and all the pump stations that we would be turning it over to but we have to resolve whether or not it would be the town owning it or some other entity at this point in time until I until we we come up with information that I'm not aware of in the design process at this point in time we're kind of picturing that entity to be the town of Pittsburgh um, whether or not that gets turned over to the town of Sanford or some other regional water, wastewater treatment authority, I mean that's in theory that's in theory possible, but that would have to be specified in, in the agreement as well, because I think that if you look at the if you look at the Goldston agreement, they're actually specifying that that the city of Sanford helps maintain the infrastructure between Goldston and Sanford. If I'm not mistaken, I don't know that that's what. We would propose right now, but it would be something in the design process that we would have to explore. But then you have the liability for the effluent between here and there too. So if there's a spill, it's on you and not somebody else. Sure. And the problem between here and there is county property. Does it make sense in your mind to create some sort of a, a WASA kind of sewer authority for this particular project? To, to the extent that there might be interconnections in the future in the southern part of the county, I think it's true. But I'm not sure how possible that is. At this point in time, the preliminary discussions with the county, they, they're, they're not envisioning um, significant development on that side of Pittsburgh, in that, in that, por in that portion of Pittsburgh. Um, so there hasn't, been, uh, there hasn't been a lot of initial interest in, um, in connecting or participating in the Forest Main Project with the town yet. We can, we can certainly keep those options open as we move forward. But. The county created water, uh, the, the county created districts in the southern part of the county uh, to cover the cost of finance and the water lines that come from Sanford up here. So, uh, but since you've got the financing pretty well taken care of from the town's end, I'm not sure that that's really necessary at this point. Um, there are lots of different ways to do it. Any other questions on the Sanford Force Main? I mean, this isn't the last time we're going to be talking about this in the next, uh, the next few meetings. So if you think of anything, don't hesitate to stop by the office or email or come by or whatever. I mean, this, is, this is something that we will, we will get through this together, I promise. Uh, Shannon Park planning dis uh, plan development district master plan. The additional elements is, uh, as you've, you've heard, I think, uh, at the joint meetings, um, we're expecting those now reportedly by the end of this month or early April. And then the first small area plans are anticipated in May of 2016. And I, I, I think just that to the mayor's comment about approving them all at once, I don't, I don't, I don't think it's necessarily accurate that we would be approving all, say, 11 small area plans um, as as one as one group. I think there there would be some differentiation between the different small area plans. But uh, again, until we see those, and this and, and this time we're hearing that it could be early May. Um, you know, it's really it's really difficult for us to say. Uh, again, with the, di the additional elements, um, how we how we go about reviewing those additional elements um, is going to be a lot easier to answer. Once we actually have those uh, in front of us, we've you know we've seen glimpses of draft copies, but we haven't really received anything in our hands to chew on. Um, when we have that, Jeff will be ste stepping forward with with uh, a matrix of sorts to, to help us walk through how we're going to go about tackling that problem, and then we can get into who helps us review and things of that nature. So there's 
there's again more work to come on that. Uh, if we can just receive those, um, would be a big, a, a big, big help to us. Well, a key component of the whole master plan agreement is the $300,000 that go towards our ability to hire professionals to help us. Mm -hmm. Ooh, which reminds me, jumping back for a moment, I'm glad to see the bit about financial advisors and eager to hear your presentation about more information in the March 28th meeting. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's, this is going to be, it's going to be exciting stuff. I think we're going to be, we're going to be very pleased with, uh, with the process, if anything. Good. Even if we don't, in some cases, like some of the work that's going to be ahead of us, uh, it, it's very nice to have the wherewithal to tackle some of this stuff. But now that we have a bit, a bit more of an idea on what we're going to actually focus uh, and describe as a scope of work for a financial advisor, I think it becomes a little bit easier to actually vet the select one. So. Good. <coughs> uh, Chatham Park Special Assessment District, we talked, uh, we, talk, we talked a bit about that already, I think. Uh, north side water system improvements, we're still uh, reviewing, uh, we're still reviewing plans on that. Um, hydrostructures and reviewing uh, water pressure modeling. Um, we, um, I think we, we probably, um, we're probably pretty close to uh, to having some uh, to having some more formal information on our part. I think that uh, the elevated tank and, and and some of the issues with uh, with the elevated tank are, are going to come up here in the near future in terms of. Uh, you know, everything from uh, with the little things like, like marking to um, um, processing all the way down to processing how um, uh, how the uh, how the project is constructed and how we actually inspect and manage the project. And we'll have some more to report on that uh, as well. Salisbury Street storm drain improvements on a very small localized level. That's complete. The asphalt that you see that's patched around the structure is uh, somewhat temporary, but I think we got it to the point where nobody's going to fall in it uh, unless they try really hard to get down there. Um, the, uh, uh, once we repave the street, I think that that'll um, that'll level out and form up around the, the drain even more. But uh, uh, congratulations to Mary Perry for first uh, public works project. <laughs> <laughs> it was a hard burst, but it's, it's, it's done. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the movement is complete over at Chatham Mills. Um, we've, um, the, uh, when I say complete, I guess, uh, there are bodies in there, and computers and phones and things like that operating. Uh, they'll be putting in some more uh, permanent, uh, not permanent necessarily, but uh, but uh, do I, how do I say we're putting in some walls and some things like that. Partition, partition is temporary, not, uh, not anything necessarily permanent. Uh, so there's a little bit of forming up to do. I think once they have everything spick and span, we'll probably have uh, sort of a semi-friendly um, um, get together, maybe just to make sure that folks know where it is. Uh, there's been uh, they've been completing a lot of work out there already. Um, and, uh, but I think we want to make sure that we, we make sure that the public is fully aware of the facility and we, we'll be putting in signage and other things uh, uh, here in the next few weeks. Finance director replacement, uh, I scheduled, conducted a couple interviews last week, um, second interviews last week. Um, uh, hopefully by the end of the week uh, I'll be able to tell you, uh, I'll be able to tell you what, what direction I'm, I'm going as far as an actual uh, selection uh, is concerned. Um, that uh, that position is obviously going to be very welcome, not only for a few of the things that we've talked about here previously, but also the the, the uh, nuts and bolts work of the budget. Which, if we didn't, if we had no Chatham Park or development discussions, we would still be having to put together uh, our annual operating budget. And um, getting someone to help with that is going to be very very uh, welcome. We also posted just recently. Um, Planner uh, position announcement for a planner two. Well, I call it a planner two. Um, that would be a person that works uh, works under Jeff on some of the more granular planning details. Frees up Jeff to, to get into um, uh, some of the more uh, more lofty small area and additional element discussions that we'll have uh, coming up, and he'll be a lot busier with uh, the higher altitude stuff. And uh, the planner two would be able to take the day to day things. Uh, but also do some some more detailed uh, review of, of a lot of the small area plans and additional element 
that, that come in as well. And I think just basically being not a little bit more than administrative, but professional and administrative hire. And so now that we're in the Chatham Mills facility and have the room to actually accommodate that position, um, we felt like it was a good time to move ahead with that. Um, we're going we're gonna to be accepting uh, resumes and applications on, on that position until April 1st, no pooling. Uh, and then we'll begin uh, interviews uh, the week of, of the 11th, and then hopefully we can get someone here in time uh, for um, small area plans uh, in mid May. Uh, so the budgeting process uh, mentioned earlier is, is ongoing. Uh, they were due, uh, I believe everybody, all the department heads uh, have turned in their, their budgets. I was going through them earlier of the scheduling some follow-up questions and meetings with department heads uh, on the submitted budget, um, going back and matching that up with the information that we had gathered during the retreat process and trying to, 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 to best fit some of your uh, some of your concerns that you raised earlier this year in the, in the, uh, in the um, discussions, um, and then formulate that into a proposed budget um, that will be submitted to you no later than May 9th. If I can get, to, get it to you before that, I, in, uh, in draft copy I will, although the, the, the copy that I give to you and the copy that we actually start discussing is invariably just a little bit different. Um, and, and it is a draft copy, as I was mentioned before. It's just keep that in mind uh, uh, as you receive the information that, that all of that is the very beginning of the discussion. Um, the May 9th, uh, the May 9th, excuse me, the May 9th date allows for three more uh, regularly scheduled board meetings: uh, May 23rd, June 13th, and June 27th. So at those three meetings, unless you schedule additional meetings or different meetings. Um, those three meetings would, would help, at least a portion of those meetings would help serve as a budget discussion. And I would propose that given the number of meetings you guys have, that you try to reserve a, approximately an hour and a half to two hours possibly um, for budget discussion and just clear out our schedule and do it that date. Alternatively, if you want to schedule additional meetings, um, it's been done before in June, depending on, depending on how our work goes. Uh, when I say our, I mean yours depending on how your discussion goes, um, you know, we may want to have more time to look at it. But at this point in time, I would uh, I'm going to propose that you stick to those three meetings and we just carve out time during those meetings to discuss, to discuss the proposed budget. Um, keeping in mind that the, the budget has to actually be formally approved um, by the end of June, by the end of the fiscal year. So that June 27th meeting is the last regularly scheduled board meeting that we have to get that done unless you set up a, you know, a, different, a different time period sometime between June 27th and June 30th. So, and that's been done before. It hasn't been done by you guys. I know I've done it before. So, um, but I, as much as possible, I'd like to finish it by then. So, um, that's all I have for now. Are there questions? I, I do have one question. That was last time we talked about doing workshops on particular complex issues in the context of regular meetings by adjusting them just a little bit. Um, given the budget situation, <coughs> should we wait for that until well, June? Or? We had um, the two, in a way, that special assessment district conversation we had tonight was more or less a workshop discussion. I kind of slipped that one by. It. Um, so, um, and, and you recall previously, we also, we also, uh, we were also contemplating um, an affordable housing uh, workshop, which, if you want to schedule additional workshopping on, on the issue of affordable housing. That's something you'll have to decide, but, but obviously last week we held that. I don't, forgive me, I don't recall if there, were there any other conversations that we were going we to have in a workshop format. Um, I think I think as some of this stuff comes up, um, I mean, we're going to have more detailed media conversation on special assessment districts and uh, enforcement main issues, and, uh, you know, I think... I think with the budget, yeah, to answer your question, it's going to be kind of challenging to fit that in. Um, so we may look at, we may look at if staff feels that there's just going to be something that's way too, way too heavy for you guys, and then we might propose something different. But, um, but at this time, at this point in time, 
you know, my, my suggestion would be to again uh, try to keep try to keep the agenda as, as efficient as possible. And we have to do a workshop. We'll, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. I had sent out an email today that basically said that um, the committee system, although it can be unbearable at times, um, could be really helpful to us. And so let us be thinking the kinds of things that could be uh, put through uh, a committee that's, that's constituted with people from the community who have expertise in a particular area. I think they're ready, willing, and able to help us, want to help us. I've spoken to a couple of people so far um, th that uh, that would really like to have some in uh, public input. And I think that's one thing that we've talked about a number of times in, in, uh, as something that we've wanted to broaden uh, for the purposes of, um, of uh, community input and, uh, and the viability of, of how we make decisions. So, um, are there any more questions for Brian with respect? We do have, uh, in our memo uh, attachment, we have a wonderful memo from Fred Royal about water availability. And um, I would like to issue a challenge right now to the fact that on the front page of this, it says the town currently uses over 100 gallons per day per capita. But the locally acceptable range is between 60 and 70. I, I have not dug out my old water bills, but I am very interested in doing so, so I can see where, where our household stands on that particular part. Is there anything you want to say about the memo, uh, Fred? I know that you basically supplied it for our information. It was a preamble for the 28th when we give a PowerPoint presentation on proposed policies, ordinance language, etc. So, um, but yeah, 100 is a it's, a, it's a, it's a gross number, if you will, based on how much water Adam delivers to the town versus how much we use, or is, or is, or is taken away, or used. It includes non-revenue water. The I and I? Well, no, the non-revenue water meaning bush. Um, potable water that disappears in the system. Mm -hmm. It's gone. And so, um, part of that 100 is non-revenue water. So, um, it doesn't literally mean you and I and everyone else in this room use 100 gallons a day on average. It just means that's the total town average, um, based on per, based on population versus amount of water we create every day. So, the, I guess the point is we want to reduce that in different ways. There's lots of ways to reduce that. Well, that was a very interesting attachment, so thank you. Fred, I have just one question on that. When we flush hydrants, do we, do we meter that raw water? We do. Okay. So it's accounted for in the pie. Gotcha. Yeah. It didn't used to be. Uh, I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't think so. I just think it's several. Um, that's good. So some infrastructure improvements like that will help us wrap our brain around where all the water is going and how it's being managed. But is the calculation simply how much water is produced daily divided by the number of residents? Yeah, so it's a gross number. Um, you know, Adam's number is subject to question because he uses what's called venturi meters. They're not as accurate as some other meters that he's discussed in the, possibly in the budget to add to his system so he has more accurate readings of what's flowing out of the plant into town. Those are called mag meters if you're curious. We're at the point in our agenda to receive commissioner concerns. Jay Farrell, do you have anything? No, I do not. Not at this time. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> and, the amazing, Here we go. and the amazing thing is that it's only 7.30. I know. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm exhausted all night. Well, that's going to be the quickest meeting ever. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Yeah.
fell asleep. We have a motion to adjourn? Yes, a move. And second and back. Thank you. Let's all stand. I'm sorry. 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 I'm sor